Yeah. Uh, so yeah, this acronym we call it CREW, uh, and uh, this is the project that we have taught in and we're going to talk about. Um, so I'll start with telling why would you want to do live migration of containers, uh, and when we'll continue to why would you want to do live migration of containers. And uh, finally, how complicated is the task and, uh, and how it's done uh, at a very, very high level overview. Uh, it's actually, this talk about, it's not about CREW per se, but one of the applications of CREW, which is live migration. So CREW is the underlying technology that makes it possible. Uh, so this is what I'm going to tell about, why live migration could be useful, why not, and what are the tools. Okay. Uh, a little bit of shameless promotion. Hey. What happened? Slide maybe. Oops. Okay. Uh, I hope I'll be able to move to the next slide. But uh, basically, live migration is very well known and very well described in science fiction. Only it's named. Uh, Teleportation. And what teleportation is, you scan the object, analyze its complete state, pass the data about this state of the object, and then reassemble it in some other place. That, that's, that's how it is. And live migration is pretty much the same thing. Uh, the, we save the state, we transfer the state, and then we recreate it. The only difference is like live migration is actually working. Good. And uh, speaking of live migration for containers, we have it available in OpenVZ for the last 10 years or so. And uh, it's implemented in the kernel as a set of kernel modules. So the kernel knows everything about what's running under it and, uh, and it can obviously checkpoint and restore that. And, uh, we tried real, real hard to uh, merge this functionality into the upstream Linux kernel, and we failed miserably. And we were not the only ones. Uh, so uh, there were other people who were interested in having uh, checkpoint and restore implementation uh, in the kernel, and it's, it's just not possible. It adds too much code into the kernel, which is already way too complicated. So, uh, and we are still maintaining our internal implementation, but four years ago we have decided that if we cannot merge it into the kernel, let's try to implement it in user space. And this is what CREO is about. Uh, it, it, it is a user space application and with a little bit of help from the kernel, we are able to do that. 
So uh, finally, why would you need to migrate containers? Uh, the first and most obvious reason, it's, it's pretty impressive. It, it looks awesome. Then, then you show it to the unexperienced user, uh, they, it, blows up, it blows them up. And uh, basically, you take a set of processes, and then you move them from one physical machine to another. That, that, that looks very cool. Uh, other reasons are you can use it to do load balancing in a, in a cluster, like if some of these nodes are overloaded and some of the servers are idling, you can move some of the workload to the idle servers. Um, uh, there are different scenarios possible in this situation. And uh, also things like kernel upgrades when you need to actually reboot the machine, uh, that usually means service interruption. So you can avoid that by migrating off your containers to a different system and reboot this one and back. Uh, actually, kernel, there are multiple ways to do kernel upgrades without uh, actually doing live migration. One way is using tools like case splice and kernel care, and the other way is instead of doing live migration, you can checkpoint and freeze the processes in, into memory, then reboot to the other kernel, then restore those processes. And uh, we, we have the technology in, in our commercial product and we are making, working on making it available in the upstream. And uh, finally, yet another reason to do live migration is, is when you need to do hardware upgrade or hardware maintenance. Uh, Uh, next, why wouldn't you want to do live migration? Because it's pretty complex and uh, various bad scenarios are possible. It's, it's really complicated technology and things can go wrong in multiple ways. Um, so you can avoid doing live migration uh, one way is if you want to do live migration for load balancing, uh, instead of migrating the applications that has the load, you can migrate the source of, of, of this applications causing the load, and it's usually the income network traffic. So you can use network load balancer instead of a live migration. Uh, one way to avoid live migration is switch, totally switch to microservices, the model that is employed by OpenStack and Docker and uh, some of the Docker-based projects such as Kubernetes. And uh, the idea with microservices basically is, is you don't have much state with the, with the applications that you run, so you can easily kill them and restart them somewhere else yeah, on, on a different system. Uh, third option to avoid live migration, it's, we call it crash driven updates. Uh, basically the idea is if you want to upgrade the kernel, you just wait for the, your machine to fail. And uh, when it fails, you press the rest button and you reboot to the new, new kernel. It sounds a little bit crazy, but a lot of our customers are using this model. Uh, so it probably has its own place. Um, finally, scheduled downtimes to say like next Friday we're going to shut down our email. Uh, so please be careful and be prepared. Uh, you cannot be screwed. This is this is the usual option that lets uh, sysadmins work over the weekend usually. Uh, so. These are the ways that you do want to, you well, don't want to do live migration. Uh, but if you choose to employ it, if you choose to use it, uh, we uh, need to understand uh, what the process involves and how it's done. Uh, and uh, basically, once you start using live migration, you'll quickly figure out that a lot of time is 
expanded on moving the memory uh, of those processes from one machine to another. And when this memory is moved, your containers are frozen, so it's not 100% live migration. It's a migration with some little bit of the frozen time, and you'd want to minimize this frozen time. There's no service interruption, there's just a delay, and you want to minimize the delay. And to minimize it, you want to exclude migrating the memory from that period of time when your container is frozen. And, and there are two options to do that. Uh, first option is to copy most of the memory or all the memory, copy that memory to the destination machine before your container is frozen. And other option is to copy that after the container is migrated. Uh, so let's take a look at the migration process given this additional requirement. It becomes a little bit more complicated. So if you choose to do pre-migration of the memory, first of all, you need to collect and transfer all the processes memory to the other machine. And uh, you might want to do it uh, iteratively because the container is running, the memory is being changed, and, and you want to do uh, a few iterations. So first of all, you migrate all the memory, then you get the list of the pages which were modified, and you migrate those, and so on and so forth. Uh, once you're happy with the result, you actually freeze the container, so memory is no longer tangent, and we do the one last iteration, copy the memory. Uh, except the memory, there's a lot of uh, processes and their states, and uh, now you want to save this state uh, to a, I don't know, file on disk or, or something else. Uh, in crew case, this is just a set of files for the all information about the processes. Uh, so you save the state, and then you copy this state, and somewhere or another make it available on the destination system. Then you recreate those processes from the state, and you let it run again. Uh, so this is how live migration would do. And if you do post memory migration rather than pre memory, pre post copy rather than pre copy, uh, you have migrated the container, but it has no memory. And you start it, and it starts to page fold. And in this case, you need to have some sort of the network swap device to swap in the container memory from the source node. Sometimes we call it lazy migration because we migrate like a little bit and then, then we do the rest in a lazy fashion. So both ways, the pre-copying pre and post-copying memory, they both have their pros and cons. And actually, does anyone have any idea why we one choose the pre-copy versus post-copy. Well, when you say you swap it in over the network, you do like RDMA. Okay, well, that, that is post-copy, yeah. Okay, so do you, I imagine it wouldn't necessarily happen all at once then, right? So it's only happening as the paging is occurring as opposed to the pre-copy. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, once paging in is occurring, you can actually start like pushing the pages out so this process will take minutes rather than hours. Uh, and, and the good thing about this approach is the container becomes available on the other machine earlier. The bad thing with this approach is it's more error prone because if the link between two machines breaks, if there's no network connection, you, you're totally screwed. You, you, have to, you, you have to kill the container, basically, and the kernel will kill it, actually. Uh, and uh, if you do pre-memory migration, there is no such problem because uh, you always have a frozen container on the source node, and if anything goes wrong, at the last moment, you can unfreeze it on the source. So the post-memory migration is 
make it faster, but it's more error prone. Well, this is why we, we try to implement both and let the user decide which one is better. Uh, anyway, let's let's see how uh, complicated is uh, the live migration, and let's describe it step by step. And, and for that, I would need I would want to compare the live migration of container versus VM. Uh, so live migration for VM is not something new. It's it's been available for more than ten years, and compared to containers, which yeah we. I think we released uh, live migration in OpenVZ in 06. Uh, mm. So what, what do we need to migrate? It's sort of the same thing. In, in case of VM, we want to migrate the environment, which, which is virtual uh, hardware. We want to migrate the virtual CPU state, and we want to migrate the memory. Uh, in case of container, it's about the same thing. It's just the environment is not the uh, virtual hardware, but uh, those C groups and namespaces that container is contained within. Uh, instead of the state of the process processor, we want to migrate the state of the processes and. Uh, everything that these processes are using. That includes open files, uh, memory mappings, uh, TCP connections, and, and, and uh, everything that these processes consume from the kernel, basically. Uh, and of course, same thing, memory. So, uh, how do we copy the memory? In case of virtual machine, the memory of the virtual machine is managed by the hypervisor. It knows everything about it. It's just a huge segment of memory, and uh, it knows which memory is modified or not. And uh, we, we just take this memory and, and copy that. Uh, in case of container, container is just a set of processes. And uh, uh, what we actually need to do is we want to go through that tree of processes, figure out what do we have, and for each process we want to figure out which memory, uh, what, what kind of memory it, it has. So we need to collect the memory uh, either regularly. And the other problem here is there are different types of memory, like there's a memory that is private to the process, that is, mem that is memory that is shared among the processes, like then you do fork, uh, lots of memory is shared between the parent and the child. Uh, and there is memory that is backed by a file on disk, like the executable or library code. And that's memory that is not backed by the file on disk. And, and so on. So we need to carefully collect all of that. Uh, carefully collect a set of processes and then collect the memory. Uh, and once we do that, we can freeze the process. In virtual machine case, you just suspend the CPU, the virtual CPU or CPUs. And uh, in case of containers, you need to stop all these processes. And there are two ways to do that. Uh, again, you can walk the tree of, of processes and uh, catch all of them and uh, send them send them to six stop, for example, uh, to stop them one by one. Uh, the problem here is while you're doing that, these processes might fork another processes and they might fork another process. So you need to be careful there and make sure you stop all of them. Uh, uh, and if, if there's a fork bomb, for example, Ryan, you, you better race with that fork bomb and try to do it faster than, than it does. Uh, well, because of that, there is a freeze to C group subsystem existing the kernel if you put your container inside that freeze C group, and most of the container implementations like, like Docker, uh, they do that, you can use this, this thing. You can say, I want to freeze this C group at once. And uh, you offload the task to the kernel. And kernel knows better how to do that. It, it, it can you know, make it way more effective. In most of the cases, we can use the freeze C group. But if, if not yet, does, the, does uh, Linux kernel have native support for freezing processes? Yes, uh, groups of processes. Uh, um, what 
what exactly happens if you freeze a process um, but while you're going down the chain a new process forms? How do you collect the new processes? Uh, it, it's, it's there, it's just not being executed. It's, it's the same thing as you send six stop to the process. It's like, yeah, it's like when you press the control Z in terminal. Same thing happens, but in this case, it's just a whole tree of processes. Uh, so once we were able to freeze all of that, we want to save the state. And uh, again, for virtual machine, it's mostly the state of the virtual hardware. Uh, it's it's a tree of objects, and we did some experiments uh, trying to save the state of the VM running say Fedora and Linux, and uh, except for memory, we found out it's about 300 k uh, kilobytes of, of state uh, of the virtual machine, and it's less than 100 objects in there, in the state. In case of container, it's also number of objects, but there's much more of those objects, uh, like for every process we have every file descriptor and for a file descriptor we have what file it is, what uh, the position of the file pointer it is, what are the flags that this file was opened with and so on. And we end up with, actually the slide is wrong, is it's about 10,000 objects for the same thing, for the same Fedora, like basic Fedora running. And this less state in terms of how how much bytes do we have in that state, but it's more in terms of how many uh, objects do we have. Um, and that's not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is objects, they don't form the tree, they form graph, because they have some interdependencies, like some of those objects, they might belong to more than one process. And, and therefore, uh, you need to be very careful collecting this information. You need to figure out, like, is this is a private mapping or a shared mapping, and to whom it belongs, and so on. And uh, finally, the problem of getting the state from the user space, and in Korea we do it from user space, is not all these objects has a decent API to get the, the state. Yes. I had never really thought about it before, but um, because you change namespaces with really after process creation, is it possible to have a process that has shared memory with the parent that is where the parent is not in the container and help Yeah, you? yeah. So how, how could you handle something like that or would you have to fail the request? Uh, I wouldn't lie to you, I don't know the answer. We, I might need to check that. But in, in general we support nested namespaces. So the answer is probably yes. Uh, but anyway, once you have uh, saved all the state, you need to copy that to the destination machine. And uh, in VM case, since that's a tree of objects, you can actually do s collecting the state and sending them to the destination at once. like. Uh, in parallel, uh, so it is serializable. You can make a pipe out of it and push it to the pipe. And in terms of container, you cannot do that because of those interdependencies. Because there might exist a situation that something that requires something that will be dumped later, uh, and so we have to first save it and then move it. We cannot do it at once. Um, Finally, restoring, in, in case of VM, we recreate all the memory, state of the CPUs, and state of the virtual hardware, and it's the same. It's the same with containers, it's just that there are much more smaller objects uh, for containers. Uh, basically, we, in CRIO, what we do is we start a process that reads all this data, like here is the process tree, here is the memory mappings, here are the files that are open, here are the network connections. And this process reads this information 
and uh, does all the proper syscalls like fork, open, connect, and and it becomes uh, eventually it becomes that set of processes that we have uh, checkpointed and. Uh, uh, you also, again, you need to be very careful about the order, how do you recreate those projects. You basically, you need to solve, solve the tasks, like this is the graph of processes, which uh, uh, these are the rules that we can uh, use to recreate those set. Like you cannot create a child process before you create a parent process. You need to follow some order in here. Uh, and basically, you, you need to solve this task of, of how to recreate it in a proper uh, way. Virtual CPUs run. You just resume those, and and it's it's sort of the same for container. You either uh, send cyclone to to every process to keep running, or or you use the uh, freeze C group and you say unfreeze. Uh, and in case you are doing that with cyclone, you need to be careful about the order in which you uh, unfreeze those processes. Because if you make it wrong, there might be some side effects, <laughs> unwanted side effects. Uh, finally, if you're implemented post memory migration, uh, in, in you, you swap in over the network. Uh, actually, this technology is not is still impossible in the upstream Linux. Uh, it's still a work in progress for both VMs and containers. Uh, for VMs. Uh, they just recently, uh, they, they just uh, recently uh, merged the so-called user fault FD, which is a way to uh, move the, to fulfill the page fault handler from the user space process. So when you have registered and then you have opened that user fault FD, once there is a page fault, Kernel wants a page of memory that is not there. It informs that user space process like I want a page, and that user space pro process is try to get this page and bring it back to the kernel, uh, and it can do this network swap. Uh, so this technology was merged into the 4.2 kernel, and uh, Currently, there is an ongoing effort to use this for KVM and QEMO, and uh, we'll probably use the same user fault FD thing. Uh, it's just currently it's not sufficient for our case because in case of uh, VM, it's the same processes that it's the same QEMO process, it's a single process that does that page fault, that incurs the page fault, and it fulfills the page fault by itself. In, in our case, this is crew who should fulfill that, and this is a set of process that, that does the page fault. Uh, and there are some other minor problems uh, that I won't bother you with. Um, so, crew is implementation of all I, I was just talking about. Uh, we, we can do every, everything except for that uh, post mi migration. Uh, and it's available from creo.org, and we have Twitter account, and we have Google Plus page, and we code this on GitHub. And this pretty vibrant community that we have around this uh, is mostly driven by Odin, but there are engineers from Google, Canonical, Red Hat. Susie, Debian, Samsung, Huawei, Docker, who are, who are working on that too. Uh, so far, we, we oh, and IBM, who are adding PowerPC support. Uh, 
We just released version 1.7.2 this week. Uh, as I said, we're four years old and we can migrate OpenVZ containers, LC, LXD, Docker containers, and uh, yeah, Docker was showing that live migration of the uh, Quake server uh, aren't enough. There is crew. Uh, and finally, Linux kernel developers are also aware of the project and they're really helpful. We have about 150 patches to the kernel to, to aid in checkpoint and restore. This is not too much compared to what would the in kernel implementation would take. Uh, I think I'm going to show a little demo at this moment. So what I'm starting here right now is XVNC server with something running inside that and will be accessing that over the network uh, using the VNC plan and currently we just uh, started the ISVM in here, the window manager. So this is a set of processes, there's three processes in here, uh, uh, it's XVNC and ISVM. And we can connect to that. Here it is. It's it's like it's not really a container. It has its own P name space and APC name space. Uh, other than that, it's running on the home. Uh We can run a terminal in here, and we can run some app. Uh, the M player. Uh, so. It's, it's been running in here, and the next thing that we do is we checkpoint this. We now take the PAD of this whole tree, and we do crew task feed crew dump. And we've got to have an option to migrate TCP connections because there is a TCP connection between the client and the server. Can you describe how that works? Connection migration? <laughs> oh, yeah. So, and I want to put these dump files uh, into a separate directory. So, this is now frozen, uh, and we can take a look at PS, XF, and these processes are gone. And we can now recreate, oh, and we can take a quick look into the image directory. We have those uh, information about those processes, including memory, like, I don't know, pipes, uh, open files and so on. So let's restore from that. And it continues to run. Uh, and we can take a look and this process are here again. So I'm going to do this Checkpoint and restore. Uh, of course, in between these two phases, you want to move these files to a different box and uh, restore it there. But this is basically what 
how live migration works. We just sort of migrated from this system to the same system. Uh, I have a little script in here that does checkpoint and restore. So if you look at the video here, you see that it freezes for some subset. Can, can you actually see that it's, the video is freezing? It, it, I, I measured this time and it's about uh, one tenth of a second and most of this time is taken to uh, take the memory out and then in again. Uh, and if we do the pre-memory copy we can actually migrate the memory beforehand. Oh, and this image here is about 50 megabytes including memory. If we exclude the memory it would be 300k. Oh, oh, actually. 100 kilobytes is the state of this set of processes running here, excluding the memory. Uh, there was a question about the TCP connection migration. Basically, uh, we have the in kernel uh, flag to create a socket uh, uh, in a so called repair state, and uh, uh, this is a flag. Uh, if we have this flag set, uh, what we do then, we call like connect, we call set, usual, usual stuff, but it moves the socket into the desired state without doing any networking. So we already have this TCP socket connected, or we had it on the other system. So we create a socket, and then we call connect, and it becomes, it moves into the connected state. Uh, so this is how we migrate the established TCP connections. And the other thing is you need to be careful about what to do with the traffic. And uh, just before doing the freeze, we add the IP tables rules on the, on the source to drop the packets. So these packets are dropped. And uh, so the other side won't get the X back, and once we have migrated, we send the, I mean, that depends on the networking being used, but uh, one scenario is we send the R pronounce, like these APs on this Mac, and, and when we uh, unfreeze everything, those send inside will be resend in the packets since it's TCP and it hasn't got back the hack. And, uh, all, all the packets will be there. And then if you're using UDP, you will lose some traffic, but it's the nature of UDP. I think that we cannot migrate TCP connections that are in closing state. That, that, that means that one side said close and the other did not. It's because the in kernel patch for that is not merged. We, we do know how to do that, it's just that the patch is not, no longer there. Uh, so yeah, that, that, that's, that's how we migrate TCP. Yeah? If the client is connected to a, uh, a container that becomes checkpointed and then restored to a different host... Um, this is what's happening here. This is the VNC client that it's connected. There, doesn't there have to be some kind of load balancing going on to Uh, I mean, that again depends on what networking model do you use. Of course, you have to make sure that uh, these two hosts that you migrate between, uh, you cannot change the AP of the container while doing migrating. So you, you need to be make sure that this AP is available, this is routed to that host or whatever. There is uh, like a so number of ways to do that. If the same IP is available, Restore, restore the same IP. It will restore the same IP. This is the only way. I mean, applications running within everything that's running within, it's not aware of the fact that it's being checkpointed and restored. 
the the only thing that it might see is the time jump forward and, and that's it uh, so we cannot change process ids we cannot change the addresses so we uh, restore everything back as it is when you said you broadcast our uh, that, that is in case you have like two servers in the same rack, they share the same network segments. You just send the R pronouns right, right. saying uh, it's it's actually optional because they they the ARP cache will have a stale record and they will figure out they will send ARP request and you'll reply. But you just need to speed this thing up. So this is why you send this AP is now on this Mac. It's not here. Yeah. You mentioned the quick demo and that uh, the crew, um, there was a kind of Docker clone, I think. Yeah. Um, in that demo, they migrated the container from like the uh, Netherlands over Oh, the yeah. I, I think they used some kind of tunneling for that. So th there are a number of ways to, to implement that. Uh, I, I think they used some, some sort of tunnels uh, to APA uh, encapsulation, maybe. So uh, what's the rest of my slides? Uh, no, uh, we have two implementations of Checkpoint and Restore. Okay. One is what we traditionally have in OpenVZ for the last 10 years. It's all in the kernel, in OpenVZ kernel. Uh, these are uh, yeah, just two, two big kernel models for Checkpoint and for Restore. And this stuff will not have made it upstream. So we re-implemented everything in user space. And uh, with a little bit of help from the kernel. And in kernel, we have like 150 patches, and they are already merged. We would have like 156 patches that are merged, and like three patches that are making their way. Uh, uh, it's some optional stuff. Basically, once you have kernel 3.10 or so, you're good. You can use Grail. So there, there's no dependence on the specific kernel, rather than it has to be decent to new one. And with the user space tool, you can actually do the migration to a different. Oh, that's that's what I'm going to tell. Okay. So back to the slides. Looks like open up is crashed. <laughs> nice. So uh, I was just talking about live migration, but Crew itself is doing checkpoint and restore, and then there are other interesting scenarios possible with this technology at hand. Uh, one way people are actually using it is for huge uh, HPC jobs, like in bioinformatics, you have some very long calculations going on in RAM, occupying gigs of RAM, and they take days or maybe weeks. And uh, if there's a power failure in the middle of it, you lose all the uh, results. 
So you can do periodic checkpoints of the state, and in case of power fail, you restore from the last checkpoint and you only lose like half an hour of work rather than days. Uh, and HPC people are also using this to uh, load the lens between nodes and cluster. Uh, one other interesting scenario is speeding up the services that are slow to boot. Uh, that's like we did a little experiment starting uh, Eclipse GUI in a container and it took 30 seconds. Then we checkpointed it and restored, and the restore takes second and a half. So uh, this can probably also be applied to the folds. Like you, you boot the fold and then you checkpoint it, and then instead of a clean reboot, you just restore. Uh, you can, with crew, you can actually make that magical save button to all of the games that are not allowed to be saved. You can, you can basically save and move back in time. Uh, the software testing, there might be some scenarios with when testing the software. They want to test the state, but from the beginning, then you start the program. When you went to that state, it takes a lot of time. And then you, I, I don't know, you have like a, you have a form of 25 pages that you need to fill in, and then there are three buttons, and you want to test those three buttons, and you need to fill those 25 pages three times. So instead of doing that, you just checkpoint, and then from that checkpoint, you press number one, press button two, press button three. Uh, uh, you can do reverse debugging, like, like you can say as with saving the games, you can move back in time. Um, and and then there are some other ways possible, some interesting things, but I'm not here to talk about it. So finally, Creo is doing the checkpoint and restore, and we have this little humpback horse, uh, the project is called p Hall Process Holder that is actually doing a live migration on top of what Creo provides. Uh, it's, it's, it's a simple thing written in Python. Uh, unlike, unlike Creo, which has lots of C code and some kernel stuff, th this is si simple Py Python wrapper that uh, calls Creo and does some other things like uh, sets up the networking and stuff. And uh, it's Creo.org slash T dot home. and uh, we have just recently merged the Docker migration. Uh, someone sent me uh, patches to do the Docker migration for Ehole, and it's also a work in progress, um, and it's very easy to work with this guy. Uh, that's basically it. If you have any other questions, comments. All right, thanks so much.